It is not uncommon to go anywhere in life nowadays and witness people who are attached to their cell phones. I mean, have you seen that where they are texting, they're not paying any attention at all, they're walking with their heads down. And I know that it's against the law uh, for people to talk on their cell phones and to text while they're driving. How many of you still see people doing it? I do all the time. And um, it really irritates me. But we live in this world of uh, instant information. There's so much information that we are trying to keep up with. Um, some people just feel that they have to know every single post somebody puts on Facebook. <laughs> what a waste of time that is. And, and so they're constantly checking their, their phone to make sure something hasn't happened that they should know about. You can get notifications. If something happens in the world, I don't know about you, but my cell phone dings, and I know that something has happened in the world, and I can find out immediately. I don't even have to turn the news on anymore. But there is 24-hour news. There's all kinds of discussion boards. There's all kinds of stuff that you can get on the Internet and find out anything you want to find out. And so the consequence is we are just attached to this, and we are constantly looking for information. Now, isn't it interesting that in this time where we are scrambling to maintain and to keep up with information, that biblical literacy, our ability to understand what is in the Bible, to know what's in the Bible, is falling precipitously. There are more and more people today who have no idea what's in the Bible. They don't know any of it. Sadly, Many of those people actually sit in church every Sunday morning. They don't know what's in the book. They know what they hear from the pulpit, but they never open the book. They don't take the time for that. Now, apparently, that was not a, that's not a new problem because here in Hebrews, what we're going to see is that the author of Hebrews is frustrated with the fact that um, he's trying to teach them deep truth. And, and already, you know, in Hebrews, there have been a few times where we've gone, I have no idea what he's talking about. And I'm just going to tell you that after the first of the year, it's going to get worse for a little while before it gets really much better. And he's frustrated because he can, I, I get the sense that he's already sensing that people are dozing on him as, as they're reading this letter of the church. And so he speaks to them in a very forceful way, almost a parental way, not because he's angry, he is frustrated, but out of love he wants to challenge the believers and hopefully will be challenged today. What we're going to see is an expression of frustration. There's a rebuke there at the beginning of chapter 6, and then we're going to see a warning that is really quite confusing as well as uh, terrifying. Right off the bat, he starts off, there is much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. And it's nice that he's not holding back any, isn't it? You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic things about God's Word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So what he's saying is that what was happening there, and quite frankly, what's happening in our society is there's a whole bunch of people who have come to embrace Christ and then have pretty well gone on to do other things. They, they've learned just enough to get by among religious people. You know, they know when to stand, when to sit down. They know what the proper response to various things is. They, they know what John 3.16 means when they see it on football games. They, they know that that's from the Bible and it's about God loving the world. They, they understand that stuff, but really they never go any deeper than that. They're content to just fit in with everybody else. And I'll be honest, there are times where, where I'll pick up a book that was written 100 years ago, or if I'm really bold, a couple hundred years ago, back in the days of the Puritans, and I'll read a sermon, and I'll come away and say, oh my gosh, they couldn't possibly have actually preached this in a church because I have to take it very slowly because it's so deep, it's so profound, it is so all-encompassing, and it 
and it's so long. And I think that would never fly here. Partially because I don't know what he's saying. So there is this sense in which I see it even in my own life that we have become um, Christianity light, so to speak. We want to just get the, the you know, just, the, just give me the basics and then I can go on to other things. What he says here is that you know, we live in a world where everybody wants bite-sized portions of everything. We want news that's just really short. You know, just, just give us the capsule summary. That's what I want to read. I, um, that's why USA Today became so popular, because their stories were short. We know that politicians no longer discuss issues because they've learned that people don't want to hear issues. They want to hear these talking points. And so if they can just hammer a few phrases, slogans, over and over again, we'll come away and we say, we think we understand what this guy wants to do. And we have no idea what the person does. We've just learned their slogan. We even uh, want abridged books, if, if we actually read the book, because we don't have to read the whole thing. Um, let's just... Remember back in college, I, I found this great series of books called Master Plots. And, and I could go in my English class and say, you've got to read this play. I could go to Master Plots and, and just in just a page, I had the whole thing. Probably better than I, if I had read the thing. I've got these wonderful books at home. I, I'm not using them the way that I should. They're called the bathroom book. And... <laughs> So you get kind of the idea here. It's, it's the bathroom book, and, and what it does is it takes these great pieces of literature and boils them down to two pages. I found that it's, it's actually still a little too long for my purposes in the bathroom, <laughs> but that's beside the point, that, that the idea is that if we can just condense it, then we can, you know, we can have all this stuff, and we don't actually have to read the book. Well, that's what's happening in our Christian faith. People don't want to study doctrine. And doctrine is a description, an explanation of what we believe, what we understand sin to be, what we understand justification to be, what we understand salvation to mean, what eternal judgment is going to involve, what the end times are going to be like. That's doctrine. But people don't want doctrine. I don't want to have to study doctrine. I don't have to study theology. Theology, that word means the study of God. Because I don't want to study theology. Think about what you're saying. I don't really want to know God. I just want to be able to get by in the world. And so this guy is really going after them. And it's not just that we are intellectually lazy. There is this sense in which experientially we are lazy. You know, we're, we're happy to write down notes on things, and then we take our notebooks and we put them up on the shelf. And the problem is we don't take those notes and say, now what am I supposed to do with this? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving only yourself is what James says. Christianity, I think we, we misunderstand. Christianity is not about, um, it's not about information. It's not about emotion. It's not about good works. Now, those things are part of Christianity, but all the other religions of the world talk about those things. Um, as far as information, if you were a Scientologist, then you would have to learn certain truths and certain facts, and, and you could master certain knowledge. I don't know what you do with that knowledge, but it's all about knowledge and, and money. And then there's the mystics and the New Age people who talk about you just got to have an experience. It's, it's all about the experience. It's all about feelings. And then many religions in the world say, you just got to be a better person. Otherwise, God's not going to like you. Christianity is not about any of those things. Christianity actually starts where all those other religions end. The other religions are trying to get you to the point where you're a better person. Christianity starts by saying what, what we're talking about here is God wanting to make us new people, brand new people. He wants to change our heart. He wants to move us in a new direction. He wants to breathe new life into us. And so we are kind of short-circuiting that process when we don't grow. Now, it's a fair question to say, so, okay, what should we be doing to grow? Well, fortunately, I have a list. Number one, we need to make it a priority in our life. If you... If you were going to be uh, 
you wanted to be good at a certain musical instrument, you would have to devote time to practice. You wanted to be good at a certain hobby, you would have to devote time to that. If you want to be a good parent, you have to devote time to that. If you want to be a good student, you've got to actually spend time studying. You've got to devote yourself to whatever it is that you want to accomplish. This idea that I can give a nod to God on Sunday and say, okay, we're good for this week, aren't we? You're never going to grow that way. We've got to make it a priority in our life. Second, you need to develop a hunger for God's Word. It's a staggering thing when you think about it. Um, Muslims, many Muslims, have actually memorized the entire Koran. And they would say to a Christian, if the Bible is your holy book, why haven't you memorized it? Hmm. We are condemned by those that we consider to be pagans who are actually more fervent in their faith than we who have the truth. Third, study theology. I'm not saying you got to go out and buy one of those big religious tomes and, and read the thing because even I don't do that. But, but read about doctrine. Find a book that talks about you know, what Christians believe and actually work through it. And we'll do some of that in the, the weeks and months to come. Um, expose yourself to solid teaching. I love Christian music. I do. I listen to a lot of Christian music. But sometimes... We need to sit down and we need to sit before good, solid teachers. And that could be through a great book. It could be through a radio ministry. It could be through your regular worship. It could just be by going to a conference or something, getting tapes, watching things online. Be careful when you do that, but find some solid teachers and listen to them. And then finally, you need to make it a matter of prayer. Um, every day I find myself saying to the Lord, Lord, please help me to grow Help me to be a deeper person. I feel like I'm, I'm tossed every direction by the winds that are out there. Please give me a root system that will stand. So that's the first thing he does. He expresses his frustration at the lack of growth. Now he kind of continues this with a rebuke in verses 1 through 3. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely, we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. Now, it's not that we should never remind ourselves of the basics of the faith. That's certainly something that we should be doing. But what he's saying is we shouldn't have to keep going over the entry-level stuff the entry-level stuff of what it means to become a child of God. It means that we, we look at our life, we recognize that we are in trouble, and we turn to Christ. We repent. We say, I need to move in a different direction. Please rescue me. Okay, that's what that first part is. We don't have to talk about what, what is baptism. Baptism is a, is a declaration of our trust in Christ. Laying out of hands could be a matter of spiritual gifts of God setting us aside to do certain things. Everybody in the church is supposed to have some kind of a job. We should be serving the Lord in some manner. It doesn't have to be in the church, but we should be serving him. God has gifted us to do certain things. And, you know, the end time stuff, that there is a judgment, that there is eternal life after this, that's all basic Christianity. The argument here is that we should be able to explain this stuff to other people. We, every believer, every true believer should be able to sit down with somebody and say, here's what the gospel is. And he said, so we shouldn't have to keep going over that. You should have that. And then it's time to build on that. Now, if this isn't, you say, oh, this is kind of deep. Eh, hang on to your bootstraps because here we go. We're going to wade in here. Verses 4 through 6 are some of the most controversial passages in the Bible. And certainly the most contentious, contended for verses in the book of Hebrews. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who are once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. 
This is serious stuff. Now, we, we get that. It's serious. It's saying that whoever it is that he's talking about, once they turn away, they can never, it is impossible for them to return. And we say, who is he talking about? What is this about? And there are three different approaches to this. And I'm going to give you all three of them because it is, it, Christians disagree on this passage. Some people believe that what he's talking about are true believers. That people who have come to a, a true faith in Christ who one day decide that they don't want that anymore and they walk away. The problem with that, again, he's saying that if you do that, it is impossible for you to come back. There are passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that we could lose our salvation, but I do not believe that's what it's teaching. The argument is that since we chose to come to Christ, since we made the decision to come to him, he will respect us enough to allow us to make the decision to walk away. And if we walk away, that's it. I would argue with that premise. I do not believe that we are saved because we have made a decision for him. I believe we are saved because God has done something first inside of us. And I take you to Romans 3 where it says, there is none that does good, not even one. There is no one who seeks God. Not even one. No one seeks him. In John chapter 6, Jesus said no one can or is able to come to the Father apart from the Spirit drawing him. So the Bible is telling us that we come to Christ because of something that God has done. In the book of Philippians, you may remember the passage, he who began a good work in you will bring it out to completion. He began the work. God is the initiator in our relationship. He is the one that has drawn us to himself. Have we reached a point where we say, yes, I am going to believe? Yes, we all have. We've made that choice. But the Bible tells us it's because of something that God did in us first. The second thing I would argue is that he seems to be telling us throughout the scripture that a true believer cannot lose their salvation. In the book of uh, Ephesians, he says, um, he has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance. A guarantee. Once we come to Christ, he places the Holy Spirit in us, and that's a seal that guarantees our inheritance. Remember Romans 8? What shall separate us from the love of God? Remember what the answer to that is? What is it? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. And so the idea that, oh, well, I'm going to mess up and that's going to separate me from the love of God, the Bible says, no, 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 nothing will separate us from the love of God. Back to that Philippians passage, he who began a good, and good work in you will bring it about to completion. He will finish the work. I want to read you a passage, and I'm just going to let you judge for yourself. This is from the Gospel of John. This is Jesus talking and these are just some words that he, he said here, John chapter 6, verse 37 and following. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should lose not even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. I'll let you be the judge. Is he promising us there that, that once we are truly his, he will never let us go? Or is he saying, God's going to hold on to you as long as you're willing for him to hold on to you? I believe wholeheartedly that no matter what I do, God has got his grip on me. And there's a security in that that knows that he will pursue me, he will bring me back, I will never, ever be lost. So I can say to people, I know I'm going to heaven. Not because of my goodness, 
Not because I am better than other people, but because I know God has done something in me that will last for eternity. So I don't think this is talking about genuine believers. The second viewpoint is that it is hypothetical. That what he's saying here is that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And, he, and he, he's taking this as an argument to its absurd level. You know, we, we do that sometimes. We'll say, um, you know, if you keep eating Twinkies like that, you're going to become a Twinkie. You know? I mean, we say things like that. And, and we don't really believe that anybody's going to turn into a Twinkie, but, but we're making a point, okay? And I think some people believe that's what he's saying here. Look, if you continue to not grow, if you continue to slide, if you continue to stagnate, if you continue to not put any energy into your faith, then you are going to become basically a person that just dies spiritually. And you're going to walk away from the Lord and you're just going to become numb and that's what's going to happen to you. Now, later on in this text, he actually talks about this he says, verse 9, Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. So this argues for the, the hypothetical nature of it. Because God's not unjust, he will not forget how hard you've worked for him, how you've shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. So, some people say all he's doing is he's saying, look, just think about this. If we have come to understand who Jesus is and we continue to ignore him and we, we continue to drift away from him, if we turn our backs on him, it shows that we don't get it. And what is going to happen is we're going to shut the door on the only thing that can save us. And so it'll be impossible. It'll be impossible for you to go to heaven apart from Christ. The third view, which is the one that I personally feel is the most reasonable, is the idea that he's talking about apparent Christians. People who are in the church, people who look good, people who have experienced all these things that he talks about here, people who have shared in the Holy Spirit, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, they've seen what God is doing, they're involved in the church, they feel the power of God's word, they see God working in other people. He's saying, you know, there are going to be some people who see all that stuff, who are in church every Sunday, but who have never really engaged, have never really made a commitment to Christ at all. They are people who are just coasting along and relying on other people's experiences. D.L. Moody wrote this. He says, The genuineness or authenticity of a conversion will be revealed in time and life. So lots of people who have experiences, lots of people who, who weep, and lots of people who say, Oh, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, but they never actually follow him. They never actually embrace him. They say the right words. They feel good. They feel like they're in. They don't have to worry about it anymore. Their ticket's punched. I don't have to worry about this stuff. And what he's arguing is that that's not what a believer is. A believer is a person who has actually put their trust in Christ to the point where they're willing to actually follow him wherever he leads them. That's true faith. And what he's saying is that, that there are some people who are going to play at this for a while. They're going to play at church, and then one day they're going to say, oh, I'm tired of this, and they're just going to wander away. I tried the church thing, they'll say, and it'll be impossible to bring them back because they have been inoculated with enough faith to keep them from getting the real thing. That's staggeringly terrifying, isn't it? Listen to these words from 1 John 2.19. Talking about people who have left the church, and he writes this, These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved they did not belong to us. 
So there are some people who get really close to the truth. They see it. They might even be attracted to it for a little bit. But then they wander away. And what we're being told here is people who are not willing to truly become a follower of Jesus are one day going to wander away and they will never be able to be brought back again. So, there's three viewpoints. This one seems, in my mind, to be verified by verse 7 and 8. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it's useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. So there's lots of people who claim to be believers, but as Moody said, the genuineness or authenticity of a conversion will be revealed in time and life. People say, I've become a follower of Jesus, and there's a sense in which we can rightly say, well, I guess we'll see, won't we? Because there should be evidence that somebody has truly become a new creature in Christ. Now, I've told you that, that this is a controversial passage, and I want you to understand that. There's going to be Christians who are going to take different positions. This is an intramural debate. This is a debate among Christians. So because somebody doesn't agree with us on this passage, that doesn't mean that they're not real believers. It just means that they've come to a different conclusion. So we must show grace in this particular thing. And practically, practically it works out the same no matter what position you take. Practically, what it's saying is that we must engage fully in the Christian faith or it is not true. It, is, it has to take root. We need to be growing because if we're not growing, we're dying. So what we come away from this saying is that what he's telling us is that the Christian life is not static. In other words, we are either growing or we are dying. There's no such thing as simply standing still. Shallow faith indicates either that our priorities have gotten out of whack and we need to take a good look at our life and change some of the things that we are doing. Or it says that we aren't truly a believer to start with. I don't, I don't know that there's any other alternatives. So if you're not growing, if you're still at that superficial level, you need to ask yourself, is this because I have lost sight of what's important and I'm letting other things crowd out my relationship with the Lord? Or am I really not a person who has embraced the true gospel message? See, there's no such thing as Christianity light. Jesus calls us to a radical commitment. He calls us to follow him into a new life. It's our job, it's, it's our delight to follow him. We should be growing so that we look more and more like him as we progress in our faith. But there's no other way to do this than to put in the hard work of discipleship, of immersing ourselves in his presence and of getting to know him more and more deeper. Most of the jobs that we have nowadays demand continuing education. They demand that you, you go to seminars, that you continue to uh, learn, that you continue to grow. The secular world gets it, that if you are not growing, you are stagnating. The same thing is true in our faith. If we become stagnant in our faith, we become inviting targets for the devil and his forces. People who are lazy in faith will continue to drift from that faith. We need to remember that people can proclaim anything they want about their faith. They can tell you all kinds of stuff about how spiritual they are and how much they love Jesus. They can post anything on Facebook about how they committed they are to the Lord. They can give endless testimonies of how they believe in Christ. However, whether or not that faith is genuine is not a matter of what we say. It is shown over the course of time by the way that we live. It will be seen in the growth that takes place in our lives and in the life that shows that we are seeking to do what God has called us to do. So may God help us to mature into his likeness. Let's pray. Father, these are hard words. There's a part of us that would just as soon you leave us alone 
to let us feel good about the fact that we've had an experience once and now we can go on and we'll deal with eternity when we get there. But you haven't called us merely to live after we die. You've called us to be part of your kingdom right here and now. You've called us to be new people. You've called us to allow you to transform us into the people you created us to be. Father, deliver us from short-sightedness. Deliver us from laziness when it comes to things of our faith. Help us to have a passion for you that will not be quenched until we see you face to face. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.